Okay, here's the next PowerPoint lecture on socialization. So we get to one of the main arguments in any of the social sciences, including sociology, nature versus nurture. To what extent are things biological or genetic? And to what extent are things the result of the environment? So the way we are socialized, are we biologically programmed to be a certain way, to learn things a certain way, to enjoy certain things, or are we just kind of products of our environments? Is it taught? Is this stuff just a product of society? Uh, Charles Darwin and his theory of evolution, we've talked about him a little bit already. This led to the nature or the biological argument for socialization. Um, there are people who think that we are instinctively competitive as human beings. We're born that way. Uh, there's some arguments and have been arguments that some people are just born criminals. There, there's something biologically um, different about them, whether it's their brain, brain structure, whatever the case may be. Uh, emotionals, uh, emotions, I'm sorry, are women naturally more emotional than men? Um, I ask that question in my classes and the answer invariably, invariably seems to be yes, women are more emotional. Well, is it that women really are more emotional or are they taught to be that way. Uh, we're, we're socialized from birth as men and women to act certain ways, to play certain roles. Guys, we're taught to be tough, not to show our emotions, not to cry. Women are taught that it's okay to socialize, to network, to show their emotions. So is it really a genetic thing or a biological phenomenon or is it something that's taught? Uh, and I would make the argument that men are just as emotional, we just don't show it. Um, if you've ever been around a guy who's got money on a football game and his team loses, see how emotional he gets. <laughs> so, but at any rate, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about gender. Cesar Lombroso was a criminologist, and we're we're back to this idea that um, that socialization can be the product of biology. Um, there are arguments that body type could be blueprints for criminality. You had the endomorph, this was the overweight or the obese body type, the ectomorph, the thin body type, and the mesomorph, the muscular body type. Uh, you know, 50, 60 years ago, the thinking was that, that men who were mesomorphs, down here the muscular body type, were more prone to criminality uh, because they were stronger, you know, they were tougher, you know, they had body hair, they had protruding foreheads, they looked more, I don't know, I hate to say it, but they looked more creature-like, I guess. So the idea was that you know overweight guys and real skinny guys probably were going to be criminals. Now we know that's not true. When I work in prisons, have for a long time, I would say the vast majority of our inmates in this state are probably somewhere right there or right here. Um, they're not exactly muscular. You have some who, that are inmates who are muscular, but most are overweight or even thin. Uh, William Sheldon was a psychologist, again, in, in the, with the idea that criminality could be biological. He felt that men were more biologically predisposed to be criminals if they had body hair, larger heads, bushy eyebrows, and protruding foreheads. So the manly man looking kind of guy um, would be more prone to criminality. Now, obviously we know this is not necessarily the case. We just made that point. John Watson was a psychologist. Um, his ideas led to the thinking that socialization is not really biological, but really largely a product of the environment. Um, he's famous for saying, I'm going to mess up his quote, but he said something to the effect of, you know, I can take any child anywhere in the world and make him or her anything that I want him or her to be, based on manipulation of the environment. Uh, he thought he could take someone, make them a, a plumber, a doctor, lawyer, whatever. As long as you know the gray matter was there in the brain, and as long as the environment could be manipulated, he could do that. Uh, so he founded in psychology this movement called behaviorism, which focuses on overt observable behaviors. And he makes the point that you know we basically learn and we're socialized not really biologically or genetically, but really through reinforcements and punishments. And it makes a lot of sense. Um, if you're reinforced, I don't want to get too technical with this, but if you're reinforced for something, reinforcement means that the chances are going to increase that you're going to engage in the same behavior. If I want to reinforce class attendance, if we actually met in a classroom, I could reinforce attendance. I could say, okay, for every class you attend, I'm going to give you $100, which I'm not going to do, by the way. Uh, that's going to reinforce your behavior. It's going to increase the chances that you'll keep coming back to class. Uh, punishment, same thing. Uh, 
well, not the same thing, I'm sorry, but, but the opposite, I'm sorry. Punishment, we want to decrease the chances that a behavior will happen. So I could give you extra work. I could make you stay after school. I could scold you for not coming to class. Again, the, the end goal is the same. Um, we're wanting to make a, we want to create a more adaptive behavior, uh, but with punishment, we're wanting to decrease that. And we're always re rewarded. You, know, you make a good grade on something, you're likely to keep working hard. You get praise from a teacher, from a parent, from a coach, you're likely to keep performing well. Uh, with punishment, you get a speeding ticket. You, now you got to pay something. you got to pay a bunch of money. So now you're less likely to speed or you're less likely to do whatever. Your parents punish you. They take your cell phone away, God forbid, or they ground you. Now you're less likely to do that terrible behavior, whatever it was. So that's how we're socialized, not biologically, but through the environment, according to Watson and people like Watson. Uh, George Herbert Mead is discussed in your book, and you, you'll want to take a particularly close look at his stuff. Um, he talks about this idea of the self, this sort of the way that we identify who we are, and the idea of the looking glass self is discussed in your book as well. We have a tendency to view ourselves kind of like through this mirror. We kind of look at ourselves and evaluate ourselves the way we think others see us. Um, if that doesn't make sense, I can maybe give you an example. Um, I may, um, I may think that others. Well, I'll tell you a story about a guy that I knew in high school. He he thought his you know what didn't stink. Um, he thought everybody else thought he was the greatest thing since sliced bread, and he acted that way, very arrogant. And truth be known, not really too many people liked him. He thought everybody did, but not too many people really liked him. But he thought about himself and perceived himself as being very popular, being very much the ladies' man, when really he wasn't. <laughs> um, so sometimes perceptions of the self can be distorted. But we tend to, to view ourselves in terms of how we think others view us. Often what, what we find is that people think that others don't like them or people feel that others think they're too fat or they're too thin or they're ugly or they're whatever usually negatively connotated stuff, but generally it's not quite that bad. Um, so, The agents of socialization, we are constantly being taught by our environment, our peers, uh, for better or for worse, our families, uh, school, for better or for worse, uh, the clubs, the social groups, the cliques that you belong to, Ethnic backgrounds, race and ethnicity play a role in, in socialization. If you have a job and you work somewhere, Work uh, is going to also teach you what it means to be a member of your society. The media, in my humble opinion, the media might be the strongest socializing force in your life at your age. More powerful than your parents, than your churches, than anything. Uh, that's just an opinion, by the way. Uh, but government, uh, all of these work together to, to, to teach you what it means to be a member of your society in, in, in West Virginia, a member of your culture in this country. So, and some images of socializing institutions. You've got church, you've got the media, this idea that we have to look a certain way. Guys, we're supposed to be thin and cut and young. Girls, you're supposed to be, well, thin in some places, right? Bigger in other places. Uh, schools, I think the image on the left, you have to look at it for a minute and then you'll get it. I think that was just kind of funny. Somebody misspelled school. It's school. <laughs> of course, the media, whether it's television, cell phones, and then the, the family. So, now, sometimes people have to be re socialized. Uh, and your book talks about this as well. Re socialization is a process of learning new norms, values, attitudes, and behaviors. Um, it can be mild or it can be significant. Uh, if you get a new boss at work, or maybe a new principal at your school, or you're in a different class with a different teacher, you have to kind of relearn the ropes, if you will. Um, you know, in every class you take, you know what you can get away with. You know, you, you can turn stuff in late. You know, maybe you can kind of get away with this. You can kind of skip this class every now and then, and you won't get in trouble. You kind of know how to gauge that. Maybe in your second class, your teacher is really strict, and they lock you out. You know, they give you tardy slips, and they won't let you have your phones in class, so you, you know what to expect in that class and everywhere in between. Um, now, re-socialization um, can work in several ways. Uh, you guys are heading toward an area of re-socialization. I'm assuming that most of you are going to college in the next year or so. Uh, you will experience re-socialization. You're going to learn 
new norms, values, attitudes, behaviors in a different physical setting as well. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous is another example of a resocialization. Um, the total institution. This is a place that is almost totally controlled by those who run it. And pretty much people in these, in these institutions are cut off from the rest of the world. Um, Resocialization can occur within a total institution. It doesn't have to, but it can. Boot camp is a good example of that. Uh, people are you know, in boot camp pretty much cut off from the rest of the world, and they're basically re-socialized. Um, they're you know, stripped down, and then they're built back up, if you will. Uh, same in prisons. There's an intake process where all the inmates, their hair is cut, they're given the same uniform. They live in, in cells, in, in prison cells. They don't get to run the streets. So it's and it's largely run, exclusively run by by the prison officials. Military schools, convents are examples of total institutions. Oops. And in the last slide, often there's what's called a degradation ceremony. This is a ritual where the goal is to remake someone's self by stripping away all of their self identity and then stamping a new one in its place. Uh, you see this a lot with boot camps again, like in the I'm going to use the U.S. Marine Corps as my example. Um, and I have friends, and I've had students who've gone through boot camps who've served our country, and it's basically it's a it's a difficult process to to go through this stripping away of identity and having a new one stamped on you. Uh, the prison intake process is the same way. Like I just said, they take your, your your hair, they cut it off, take your clothes, take your possessions, they put you in a uniform. Everybody has the same uniform, by the way, uh, pretty much. Uh, also, initiation into fraternities. If you're thinking about joining a, a sorority, or particularly a fraternity in college, I would consider very carefully what you're willing to do to be a part of the fraternity. There are multiple accounts of hazing um, that occur on college campuses, and you see the image down at the bottom, bottom right. Uh, the idea of stripping away people's identity and then stamping something completely new and different on them. Uh, there's a lot of debate, whether it's the military, whether it's prison, whether it's fraternities, about how um, mentally healthy it is or socially appropriate it is to have people partake in this degradation ceremony. A lot of controversy swirls around this kind of stuff as well. But it can be effective. It can work. Uh, sometimes it works against the person. Sometimes it can help the person feel a part of a team or part of a unit. Uh, we'll call that the end of this part. Thanks.